Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Ramesh Ayala from Tulane School of Medicine here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Welcome to our uh, uh, lecture on globe trauma presented by Meditrad and a leader in online training and education. Today, we're going to cover um, uh, trauma related to orbit, eyelid, and globe briefly followed by uh, uh, a brief coverage of alkali and uh, acid burns. Um, I'm covering this as a uh, introduction to these uh, topics. Uh, by no means is this lecture a comprehensive lecture to, um, uh, uh, to give you full details as to how to repair um, and treat these patients. This uh, lecture is more to be used as a guide uh, towards further reading and uh, appropriate um, management techniques need to be learned from experienced faculty members. Because uh, these uh, uh, topics um, and uh, when you see patients involving this kind of trauma uh, have to be taken seriously and uh, treated appropriately. Orbital trauma, all patients with orbital trauma must have a complete ocular examination to rule out ocular trauma. Um, Mid-facial fractures and orbital floor fractures are what we're going to concentrate on today. Um, so how to approach a patient with open globe? Um, uh, first of all, you have to take a brief history. If you suspect open globe, uh, call your senior resident, and this is for uh, the sake of the first and second year residents because in most residency programs, it's the junior resident who first encounters the patient with an open globe. Uh, make sure that the patient had a tetanus, IV access, IV antibiotics, narcotics, and antiemetics. Uh, call the OR or anesthesia staff to highlight the fact that the patient with an open globe um, is coming in. Uh, protect the eye with a shield. Do not patch the eye. By patching the eye, you're going to exert more pressure on the globe that's already ruptured and open, and uh, in the process may um, force the contents of the eye to come out. So as I said, um, when you examine these eyes with an open globe, apply no pressure. Suspect open globe when you see the following. Um, so um, when you see penetrating lid injury, when you see um, uh, bullous subconjunctival hemorrhage, when you see corneoscleral laceration, when you see shallow chamber and a peaked pupil, any one of these signs, if you see them, suspect open globe and tread carefully. So globe trauma, what to look for? You want to look for iris prolapse, hyphema, iris disinsertion, dislocated lens, vitreous hemorrhage, and when there's no red reflex, think of vitreous hemorrhage or detached retina. Let's move on to bone fractures. Um, um, when uh, you have uh, significant trauma to the, uh, to the orbits, you can end up with orbital bone fractures um, and uh, you will be frequently called by the ENT and plastics and the ER guys to rule out orbital floor fractures and, uh, and to do a complete eye examination. Uh, uh, and this probably is the most common reason why an ophthalmic, uh, re ophthalmology resident is called into the emergency room. So field orbital rim for discontinuity. If you suspect intraocular form body, you want to order a CT, not an MRI, because uh, these intraocular form bodies could be magnetic. And uh, by ordering an MRI, you're forcing the form body to come out in a disruptive fashion. The, Pictures that you see here are taken from the Iowa Ophthalmology University uh, website. I hope uh, they don't mind as uh, this is also a teaching site and essentially are showing various locations of orbital floor fractures with intraocular form body <coughs> location. Here are some more pictures I borrowed from the University of Iowa, a wonderful website, um, and they do exhibit their um, extensive knowledge especially uh, this guy, Dr. Andrew um, Tion. Um, he is, uh, he's got extensive 
um, uh, write-ups on their on the University of Iowa Ophthalmology website. So I encourage everyone to visit it and uh, go, uh, and and, uh, and read the topics that they are covering in there. You can see um, a peak pupil in this in this picture here, um, and the iris prolapse uh, with the, in the subconjunctival space in this location here. When you see this while in trauma, suspect a penetrating injury. Uh, here is a patient with psychoiridodialysis. Um, uh, here is a patient with what appears to be uh, bullous uh, conjunctival hemorrhage and uh, soft eye. Um, um, here is a patient with hyphema and uh, could be a traumatic laceration in this direction. Um, uh, here is an open globe through the conjunctival and sclera that's picking, picking up stain in that area. Um, so careful examination is what is needed when you're dealing with these uh, patients with suspected open globes. Uh, do not apply any pressure while you're doing this. Uh, gentle pressure, the patient, remember, is in severe pain um, because of the trauma, and you do not want to worsen the situation by applying more pressure on the eye. Um, in both situations, as the patient squeezes his eye as you try to open it, and if you apply pressure, the intraocular contents um, could come out through the site of the perforation. Uh, so uh, once you suspect open globe, it's best to do the rest of the exam in the uh, um, rest of the exam in the uh, uh, um, in the operating room under general anesthesia. Uh, looks like this particular patient here has a subluxated lens. You can see the dislocated lens, which has turned white, probably from trauma. Some more um, uh, pictures of severe trauma. You can see a white uh, traumatic cataract in this particular patient. Um, you can see extensive lacerations involving the forehead. Um, uh, um, you can see another patient with a cornea lid laceration and open globe um, and severe cases of motor vehicle accident involving uh, the orbital flow um, uh, fracture. So mid-facial fractures are called the, Le the Lefort um, uh, fractures. These are classified um, uh, into three categories. The Lefort fractures must extend posteriorly through the pterygoid plates. Um, the Lefort fracture type 1 um, involves a low transverse maxillary fracture above the teeth with no orbital involvement. Um, Lefort fracture 2 involves a pyramidal fracture involving the nasal, acromal, and maxillary bones and the medial orbital wall. And type 3 causes craniofacial disjunction and involves the orbital floor, medial, and lateral wall. Um, this classification is useful uh, for you to understand the severity of the orbital fractures and also frequently asked question in your board examination. Orbital floor fractures, pay attention to orbital floor fractures. Now, you should not miss if uh, there, you see a patient also frequently tested um, in your uh, boards. A direct uh, fracture is extension from the inferior orbital rim. Um, indirect is not associated with the uh, fracture of the orbital rim. It results from sudden increase in intraorbital pressure or orbital floor buckling from extension of compressive force extension from the orbital rim. These orbital floor fractures are frequently associated with the lid echemosis and edema, diplopia with limitation of elevation or depression or both, and ophthalmos, ptosis, hypostasia in the distribution of inferior, inferior orbital nerve, emphysema of the orbit and eyelids. So look out for all of these signs, um, and when you see them, suspect uh, orbital floor fracture. The treatment for the orbital floor fracture, if uh, the patient happens to be an adult, uh, initial observation for seven to 10 days, oral antibiotics and steroids for seven to 10 days to decrease the swelling, following which um, you can uh, offer treatment, um, and we'll go through that in the next slide. Children with trapped inferior rectus muscle need urgent repair as it can cause bradycardia via the oculocardiac reflux. Remember this. 
So indications for surgery after the initial treatment in an adult are to reduce the swelling and prevent infection, persistent diplopia with limitation of up gaze or down gaze with positive traction test, um, plus a CT MRI evidence of trapped muscle seven to 10 days post trauma uh, is uh, a number one indication for treatment. Um, also patients with more than two millimeters of anophthalmos and large fractures involving greater than 50% of the orbital floor. All three of these are indications for taking the patient to the operating room and repairing the floor fractures. You should listen to our um, oculoplasty lectures by uh, Dr. Dora Raj um, uh, uh, for you to gain more knowledge in terms of uh, the surgical techniques being used for um, uh, the orbital floor fracture repair. So the treatment involves exploration, release of the muscle and plate to prevent recurrent entrapment. Intraocular form body, uh, wood or vegetable form bodies in the orbit should be removed. Uh, if it's a BB uh, gun injury, it's best left in, um, without disturbance. MRI can be safely performed with a BB gun injury in the orbit. Loss of vision with clear media, look for afferent pupillary defect, which indicates optic nerve damage. Um, in that situation, do an uh, CT or MRI. Steroids can be used um, in the presence of traumatic optic neuropathy. Um, the studies are variable. Most people conclude that uh, it's of, if the optic nerve is severely damaged, it may not help. But if the optic nerve is just confused, then the steroids may be of some uh, help. Loss of vision with clear media. Um, check the intraocular pressure, afferent pupillary defect, tight orbit and proptosis, suspect orbital hemorrhage. If this were to be the case, it needs emergent orbital decompression. Um, uh, so perform a lateral canthotomy and a superior and inferior cantholysis. Um, uh, this procedure should be taught to every ophthalmologist and ophthalmology resident so they can take care of uh, business in the emergency room um, uh, as soon as they recognize this. So if a patient presents to you with a tight orbit, um, and, with, and proptosis and exhibits elevated intraocular pressure and an afferent pupillary defect, remember orbital hemorrhage and that needs to be decompressed immediately. Blunt eyelid trauma um, presents to you with ecchymosis, needs complete eye examination including dilated fundus examination and uh, to rule out orbital floor fractures, you want to perform a CT or an MRI. Penetrating trauma to the lids, the lid laceration uh, and uh, along with the revulsion of the orbital fat indicates orbital septum uh, being violated. Orbital fat prolapse in the upper lid wound. Levator should be explored and carefully repaired to avoid ptosis. Orbital septum laceration should not be sutured, close the skin and orbit laris. Um, orbital septum incorporation into the wound can give you lag of thalamus. So try not to incorporate orbital septum for that reason. Eyelid uh, margin layer lacerations, again, um, uh, uh, a, from the practical point of view, you need to know how to tackle this, and also they do pose uh, some questions regarding this. Vertical matter suture to the margin along the mebum gland orifice should be the initial um, uh, uh, suture that you want to place to get the anatomy right. Tarsal plate closure is to follow the, the vertical mattress lid margin suture. Vertical matter suture to the margin anterior to the gray line um, uh, is the place to apply. Uh, skin and the muscles are closed after this. Canthal injuries, uh, remember, uh, results uh, from horizontal traction, meaning that the, the lid is dragged this way or this way, which is where um, you have um, canthal injuries. Lateral cantal angle is sharp and medial cantal angle is slightly rounded. That's a normal appearance. A disturbance in this appearance is when you suspect cantal injuries. Rounding of the medial cantal tendon and acquired telecanthus um, indicates medial cantal tendon avulsion. If you are in doubt, always call your arthroplasty doctor to take care of these lacerations uh, to help you out. Um, uh, but the important thing is for you to recognize 
um, uh, lid lacerations, cantal injuries, orbital floor fractures, uh, perform a complete eye examination along with them um, and uh, treat the patient appropriately. Let's move on to chemical injuries. Um, this is a very important topic, not only to protect the um, vision of the patient um, in terms of immediate emergent management, but also from your exam point of view. Alkali um, burns result in worse injury compared to the acid burns. Remember that, try to identify the offending agent if possible. The offending chemical may be in the form of a solid, liquid, powder, mist, or vapor. So the way the alkali burns work, they increase the pH, um, uh, saponification of fatty acids in cell membrane and cellular dis disruption results on exposure to the alkali. Um, damage the surface epithelium leads to stromal penetration with damage to the stromal matrix. Um, the alkali burn, uh, the alkali can penetrate in severe cases into the antechamber causing inflammation of the antechamber tissues and tissue damage. Whereas acid burn results in denature and precipitation of the protein and as such, they cause less inflammation and tissue damage than alkali solutions. Um, uh, buffering capacity of the tissue and precipitated protein barrier um, effect results in, um, in less inflammation and tissue damage compared to the alkali solutions. How do you grade the chemical burn? Uh, grade one, less than 50% of the corneal epithelium takes stain, minimal conjunctival involvement. Um, grade two, now, I should add that you should follow the current uh, grading system that is given in your BCSC book. Um, this, the variety of grading of this um, uh, chemical burns, um, this is one way where you look at the corneal epithelium and the conjunctival involvement. Um, uh, the more commonly used one, current one, deals with uh, corneal um, haze along with the limbal ischemia. Um, so in this particular grading technique, it's um, less than 50% of the corneal epithelial, uh, epithelium involvement with minimal conjunctival involvement, meaning that the limbal ischemia is absent. Uh, in grade two, 50 to 75% epithelial damage uh, with, uh, uh, with less than one, one third uh, limbal ischemia. Uh, in grade three, grade two plus greater than 50% limbal damage or limbal ischemia, and in grade three, there's a stromal um, haze uh, um, uh, to the point that uh, details of the iris and the lens may be a little hazy, fuzzy. Uh, in grade four, the 100% cornea conjunctival epithelial damage, the cornea is opaque, and the greater than 50% limbal ischemia is associated with this. So the chemical burns because of limbal damage leads to uh, stem cell death and conjectivization of the cornea. So it's always important for you to look at the limbus and decide if, the, if there is associated stem cells while you're classifying these, um, these uh, patients. Um, anterior chamber penetration of the uh, chemical can lead to cataract and secondary glaucoma and diuritis. In severe cases, you can see patients with the cornea scleral melt. So in terms of management, immediate and copious irrigation is the number one step. Remember this, both from the board's point of view and for practical treatment point of view, immediate and copious irrigation with whatever solution that you have to wash out the chemical out of the eye. Um, it could be water, it could be BSS. If nothing is available, clean um, uh, liquids that are there, such as a carbonated um, uh, uh, Coke can. Um, is use coke. I mean, anything that you have that is uh, clean, um, use that liquid to wash or dye. Continue to um, uh, continue the copious irrigation till the pH normalizes. Normal saline water, soda pop, any non-toxic and unpolluted liquid is okay. Um, top, topical anesthesia, lit speculum um, will help you to irrigate. Uh, continue saline drip or ir irrigating lit speculum. Um, is uh, or should be available in most of the emergency rooms and can be used, especially in the presence of alkali burn, to wash out um, uh, the alkali till the pH stabilizes. Then remove any particulate um, chemical, cotton tape or forceps um, under the uh, slit lamp. Uh, 
please make sure that you look under the lid. Now, um, once you, you've uh, irrigated dye copiously, pH is brought back to normal, and any particulate material that is there, especially under the lid, um, is uh, taken out. Um, the next step in the treatment uh, would be to uh, decrease inflammation um, and decrease spearmint, uh, 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 the white cell function, and uh, that's with the help of a uh, heavy dose of steroids every hour. Um, Predacetate would be an ideal choice here for the first um, two weeks. At the end of two weeks, you want to decrease the topical steroid usage. Um, the reason why is to decrease the likelihood of um, uh, stromal melt. Um, and then um, consider using doxy or citric acid. Uh, these are chelators of extracellular calcium that uh, um, decrease the cell membrane calcium and results in the white cell stability. Once the white cells become stable, they're less likely to release uh, collagenolytic enzymes that can cause collagenolysis in stromal mouth. Uh, cycloplegic agents, both to decrease the pressure, or to decrease the pain, and also to um, improve uh, uh, the, uh, the pupil or decrease the risk of pupil from developing cynical adhesions should the patient have uh, antichamber involvement. Topical antibiotics, of course, uh, to decrease the risk of infection. Um, uh, I tend to use the Turbodex ointment, which acts both as a lubricant and has both a steroid and antibiotic, uh, especially in mild, uh, moderate cases. Uh, vitamin C, two grams per day, um, help promote collagen synthesis in patients with severe alkali burns, something to be considered. Epithelial healing um, um, uh, in patients with uh, a, uh, especially chemical burns uh, with persistent epithelial defect or any epithelial defect right from the beginning, aggressive management strategy should be employed to promote epithelial healing. Um, uh, and this includes frequent preservative-free artificial tears, bandage contact lens usage, uh, tarsography. Um, um, central tarsography is a very uh, useful technique in this kind of cases um, with uh, persistent epithelial defect, amniotic membrane, um, uh, either as a graft or as a contact lens, limbal stem cell transplant, transplantation after at least two weeks of trying the uh, other te uh, techniques, which are non-invasive. Um, uh, lastly, um, should the cornea melt, um, you may consider an emergency cornea transplant. Prognosis is poor, and uh, there's a role for keratoprosthesis. Um, especially in severe chemical burns with, uh, uh, and there are type one and type two Boston keratoprosthesis, uh, depending upon the severity of the burn, um, patients are selected to, to have uh, type one and type two. Uh, but the initial things that you can do uh, include frequent use of preservative free lubricants, um, the role of bandage contact lens to promote epithelial healing, and tarsorophy. And nowadays, uh, the free availability of amniotic membrane contact lens should be considered, all of these should be considered initially by you. If that doesn't work, um, obviously refer the patient to a specialist for consideration of limbal cell cell transplantation. Um, and should that doesn't work, a PKP or a keratoprosthesis. Here, uh, uh, here is a patient with amniotic membrane graft in grade two, three, before and after. Um, and as you can see, um, uh, uh, following the transplantation, um, amniotic membrane graft, uh, the epithelium uh, healed nicely. Um, here is another example of a patient with a grade four chemical burn in following AMG um, amniotic membrane graft, um, the epithelium healed nicely. So these pictures are taken by um, uh, taken from this um, paper published in I in 2003, temporary amniotic membrane patching for acute chemical burns, uh, uh, by Schaefer Sang and his colleagues. Uh, Dr. Sh Dr. Schaefer Sang has done some remarkable work um, in this field and and described the role of amniotic membrane grafts 
um, especially uh, in, in chemical burns and Steven Johnson syndrome patients, something for every one of you to remember. I would strongly encourage you to follow the literature by Dr. Schaefer Sang in this regards. Um, here is uh, the technique involved in uh, application of amniotic membrane graft. The idea is to drape the entire um, um, uh, conjunctiva and cornea um, for limbus to, uh, from fornix to superior fornix to inferior fornix, and then twist it outwards to cover the uh, inside of the lid as well. And then uh, using uh, uh, matter sutures, uh, suture the amniotic membrane um, to the inside of the conjunctiva. And once that's done, um, and the, this, these are steps involved in, uh, in uh, various steps involved in this. Uh, what they're trying to do is to anchor it down to the limbus, anchor it down to the lids, and uh, by the time you're done, you have uh, the amniotic membrane covering the entire uh, cornea, epithelium, uh, the conjunctiva, and the, uh, both the palpable and the bulbar conjunctiva. And here is the here is the detailed technique as to how this is done. A description of this is available in Shepard Sang's uh, classic paper on this topic. Um, uh, uh, this is a fairly easy technique for most of you um, to do. Um, a very useful technique, especially in the acute setting of severe chemical burns in Stephen Johnson's patients. So um, that concludes the topic, uh, the lecture for today. I thank you uh, uh, for listening to this lecture. Look out for more lectures at Meditred uh, YouTube website and look out for our upcoming CME and board review courses. As always, if, should you have any comments, so please uh, send your comments to ayala at meditred.com or rayala at tulane.edu. Uh, thank you for your attention.